Banks. She is the new speech language pathologist here at Southern Virginia Regional Medical Center. She holds a Master of Science in Communication Sciences and Disorders from Longwood University and is a member of the American Speech Language Hearing Association and the Division 13 Special Interest Group for Swallowing Disorders. She had a professional background in public education and social work prior to becoming a medical speech language um, pathologist. Stacy is comfortable working with children and adults of all ages suffering from a variety of communication, swallowing, and voice disorders. She is fully bilingual in Spanish and English and has an extensive experience working with individuals from diverse ethnic, racial, and language backgrounds. She lives in Southfield, Virginia, and she enjoys spending her time with her family, singing, acting, and reading historical fiction in her spare time. In the spirit of providing comprehensive care to the local community, the Rehab Services Department of Southern Virginia Regional Medical Center is now proud to offer speech and swallowing diagnostic and therapy services to both inpatients and outpatients of all ages here in Emporia. So we are very happy to have her with us this afternoon. At this time, she'll come forth and do her presentation. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, first of all, I want to say that I appreciate everyone's participation in our little how many times a day does the average person swallow game. I never thought that anybody would guess the exact number, but someone has indeed guessed the exact number of times that the average person swallows in a day, and that person is Mr. Bobby Griffin. The number of times that he guessed, which is the correct number, is 600. <laughs> the, the guesses ranged anywhere from 100 to 2,500. So there's a really big range of, of what people think would be the average number of times a day that a person swallows. Um, before I get started, I want to thank the Chamber for inviting me to speak, and I would like to thank the hospital for uh, promoting the service in the community and for employing me to provide the service. And I'd also like to thank uh, my department director, Mr. Antoine Hatch, who is here um, to support me during this presentation. Except for the, the where, there he is, <laughs> in the blue shirt. <laughs> um, and, and also to thank him, too, for really pushing for a um, I've been here in Emporia since January 15th. And I've been working really hard at trying to get the program up and off the ground. Um, and we're doing a lot of new things, and I'm going to let you see some of those. So we have a speech-language pathologist. Who needs one? <laughs> James. My son James Stokes. He began when he was four years old, progressively got more since he started school. Stuttering has affected him academically academic and social. Reading aloud in class has always been one of his worst fears, and his teachers have often reported that he pretended to be sick or used to use restroom in his term when he was when his term was approaching. He has few friends because most of the kids his age prefer to make fun of his speech instead of getting to know him. He avoids talking in public places because he's afraid of his kids' courage. Now is the time in his life when he should be interviewing for his first job and asking a young lady for a date. But he is not going to deal with those normal things out of fear of embarrassment. My son James needs to speak language about it. Thank you. Can everyone hear the people who are speaking? Make sure, we, for all of my wonderful audience participation victims, <laughs> you can please make sure that you speak nice and loud. Thank you, Mr. Griffin. You're welcome. Amy. My wife Amy is an elementary school teacher. She has been having a lot of trouble with her voice lately and has even had to stay home from work because she has lost her voice. She often, often sounds hoarse and she complains of pain when she talks. She went to an ear, nose, and throat doctor who looked at her vocal cords and told her that she has vocal nodules from using her voice improperly. 
He recommended a course of voice therapy with a speech pathologist before considering surgical removal of the nodules. If she can learn how to use her voice properly, she can avoid having this problem again, which is important because her job depends on her ability to talk to her student. She can't teach without a voice. My wife, Amy, needs a speech pathologist. Thank you. Laura. My daughter, Laura, did not speak her first words in class when she was two years old. When she started school, I worried that she would fall behind her classmates because she could not understand and use words like they could. That is exactly what happened. By the first grade, it was clear that she could not keep up with the other students in reading, writing, and oral language. Her four-year-old sister had a bigger vocabulary than Laura did at the age of six. Her teacher referred her for testing to see if she had an intellectual disability. The testing showed that Laura does not have an intellectual disability. She has a developmental language delay. My daughter Laura needs a speech language pathologist. Thank you. Jared. My brother Jared was involved in a serious car accident in which he sustained a traumatic brain injury when the car rolled and his head struck the frame of the car. After he was medically stable and he spent several weeks in a rehabilitation center for patients with brain injuries. He is home now and still has trouble with a number of important daily tasks, including remembering what time to take his medication, solving minor problems, and handling money correctly. His speech is slow and sometimes slurred, but it's better than it was. His main issue is that he cannot return to his job until his cognitive skills are improved. He needs to be able to keep track of multiple events, be aware of time, and demonstrate recovery of basic math skills. My brother Jared needs a speech pathologist. Thank you. Isaiah. My son Isaiah cannot pronounce words correctly. He talks all the time and I understand about 75% of what he says, but strangers can only understand 25%. He hates it when, when people ask him to repeat himself, which happens frequently. Instead of trying to communicate over and over again, he usually hangs his head and stops talking and walks away. Right now, he is, so much, he is learning the letter sounds of kindergarten and is having a lot of trouble. I am told that if left untreated, this problem could cause him to have trouble to learning to read and write. Right now, the other children try to play with him, but his teacher says that he is frustrated when they do not understand what he is saying, and he often needs to be to play along. My son, I may have to play college. Thank you. Esther? Yesterday, my mother Esther had a stroke. My father called me and asked me to come over because Mama wasn't right. When I got there, one side of her mouth was moved and I could barely understand what she was trying to say to me. The right side of her body was so weak that she couldn't even <coughs> walk or raise her arm. She went by ambulance to the hospital and she is there now. The first time she tried to eat a meal after her stroke, my mother choked on her food and coughed violently when she drank her water. The doctor ordered an evaluation by the speech language pathologist who evaluated mom, evaluated mama's swallowing, swallowing as well as her speech. Apparently the stroke affected the nerve that controls swallowing, so now she is unable to eat or drink normally. She is also unable to make sense when she talks. <coughs> Sometimes she gets an understandable phrase out. I can I can tell that she knows what she wants to say, but it comes out like gibberish. She gets so discouraged and frustrated, her whole life changes in an instant. My mother Esther needs a speech pathologist to help her with speaking and swallowing so she can eat and drink safely and communicate with others with you. Thank you. And Brad. My brother Brad was diagnosed with Lou Gehrig's disease last year. He is a successful businessman in his 40s with a wife and three children. This devastating diagnosis came out of nowhere as he was previously a perfectly healthy person. Over the last two weeks, he has lost his ability to speak. His doctor says that he will likely never regain it. Now he is confined to a wheelchair, and because he has lost the use of his hands, he can't even write or use a computer to type what he wants to say. His mind is perfectly intact. He is locked inside his body with no way to communicate to anyone or to continue to run his business. <coughs> his wife has been told that there are communication devices that could give him a voice again, devices that could be controlled with his eyes. 
My brother, Brad, Brad needs a speech pathologist. Thank you. I'd like to show you a video of the device that she just talked about, what her brother Brad needs. For years now, special eye tracking software has helped people who face physical challenges communicate with others. Now that software is going mainstream. That's right, no mouse, no keyboard, just your eyes can get online. Well, <laughs> we can hear it, we just can't see it. Stephanie Abrams shows us how it can work for you. Yeah. We may have to watch that. Christopher Taylor plays music from the computer on his wheelchair as he glances at pictures of his healthier beers around his Silmar home. Lou Gehrig's disease started eating away at Chris's body when he turned 21. The doctors gave him two years to live. He's 43. It's amazing. I'm very fortunate to have my son. But Gwen says her paralyzed son lost his smile 10 years ago when he lost his voice. This computer just brought it back. Sure. With eye tracking technology. This just opened up a whole new world for him. He can't touch the screen with his fingers, but now he can reach out through his eyes. The red dot shows where he's looking, enabling him to write and give us this interview. How has this device changed your life? I'm more free. I'm able to do things that I couldn't otherwise do. He's written this science fiction novel and is working on his memoirs. He connects to his friends on Facebook and on his blog. His latest entry, Look Ma, No Hands. For people who are in my position, your life isn't over. And be a participant in life. A company called Toby ATI initially created that eye tracking technology for people like Chris, but they're about to mass market it with a device anyone can buy that attaches to the bottom of a regular computer screen. The sensors go out into the eyes, like I mentioned, and reflects back, knows where the eyes are in space, and then they have the computer access all over the computer. Anything that you do with a computer with a keyboard and mouse, you could do it with the, the PCI. The PCI syncs with your eyes, just like Chris's computer. But functions faster for those who can also use their hands, multitasking eye movement with typing. Here the company demonstrates an all-in-one laptop showing the luxury of hands-free scrolling as your eyes simply reach the bottom of the page and sight control for the game Asteroids. For Chris, the technologies helped him win the battle with his body. Chris, can you use your phone on here? I use it almost every day. He calls it freedom. For you and I, it's a new vision for computing. I'll take you just the way you are. PCI will cost about $7,000, although that price may drop as it becomes more popular. If that doesn't give you chills. <laughs> And maybe it just gives me chills because I'm a speech pathologist. Um, but I have worked with patients and, get, and helped them use those devices. And there's nothing more fulfilling or rewarding than to be able to restore to someone who has lost their ability to communicate, the ability to communicate and carry on with their life. Um, one of the challenges, I wanted to show this video spot because a lot of times people who live in rural areas like this have to travel a long way to be able to get connected with someone who can help them with that. And I really believe that people should be able to receive services locally in their community where they live. And I'm really excited to be here and also to have made the acquaintance of Mr. Blackman, um, who introduced himself at the beginning because he has some experience in obtaining the devices, and I have experience in programming them and working with people who need them. Um, that's not, the, of course, the only thing we do. We do a lot of work with swallowing and some of the other things that you've heard about. And I just want to ask you, after hearing all of those profiles, um, how many people in the room have known someone or had a family member who matched any of those descriptions or any part of that description? Okay, a lot of people. 
a lot of people. Uh, many people think that speech pathologists just help children with their R sound and their S sound, <laughs> which we do, and we can do that. But there's so much more that we do. And here in the hospital, probably 85% of what I do is dealing with swallowing disorders, assessing people and providing treatment for people who have swallowing disorders, perhaps because of a stroke or a brain injury, um, or just because they are getting older. And sometimes, as we all know, our bodies don't function at peak performance when we get older, and sometimes swallowing is affected. And that can be very serious because when a person has a swallowing disorder that's not being treated, they can aspirate food into their lungs and subsequently develop pneumonia, which can be deadly for some of our elderly population. Um, so it's a very important role that we play that most people don't think about. When you hear speech-language pathologists, you don't really think about swallowing. So let me continue the presentation. I just crunched some numbers. I took some national statistics. So this is not exact. I don't have this from anything that's published about Greensville County. But statistically speaking, in Greensville County, there are approximately 122 people who stutter. 245 have a voice disorder. 245 have a speech sound disorder that may come after a stroke where they can't produce the sounds even though they know what they want to say. Um, 367 have a language disorder and 612 have a swallowing disorder. So there could be as many as 1,346 adults and children in Greensville County that needs, need the services of a speech-language pathologist, which is why I'm so proud of the hospital for inviting me to come. Um, who is currently being served? There are three speech pathologists who serve 135 children in the school system, and they're pretty much at capacity. Um, we're working with the children that they're working with. There's one who serves both nursing homes, and I don't know of anyone here who's in private practice. Um, and then some are served by speech pathologists in distant locations. I know that when I was working at CMH in South Hill, I had several patients that came to me from Emporia because there wasn't someone here locally who could help them. Um, but there are many who are not being served. <coughs> And now, we can serve them. So, um, I think that, it, as I said, I think it's extremely important for people to be able to receive the care that they need locally if the, if the services can be available. And everything that we've talked about today, all of the profiles that have been read, are services that are now available to people who are in the hospital, to people who come on an outpatient basis. You have some um, promotional materials the hospitals recently <coughs> acquired as far as our services go with you, and I would just ask and encourage you to share them with anyone you know who may need the services of a speech pathologist, and I am extremely excited to be here, and I'd like to know if anyone has any questions. Yes, sir. I saw in your chart that there was some percentage that have a sound disorder, and then you said another percentage that had a language disorder. Yes, sir. What, what is a language disorder? Uh, a couple of different kinds of language disorders. Some language disorders occur with children where they have a delay in acquiring language. They may not start speaking until later than they should. They may not have the vocabulary or they may not be able to put their words and sentences together the way that they should be able to. Those are developmental language disorders. The other type of language disorder that we may work with um, would be what's called aphasia, where possibly a stroke patient after their stroke, several different types of aphasia exist, but after their stroke, they may know what they want to say and they can't find the words. It, they always feel like it's on the tip of their tongue. Or they may speak fluently, but it doesn't sound like English. It sounds like, I think the word was gibberish in, in the one that Esther read for Esther. Um, so those are a couple of different types of language disorders. And then the speech, the speech sound disorders can be children with articulation problems, or they can be adults who, after a stroke, can't form the sounds. They know what they want to say again, but they can't get their mouth 
to jive with their brain to make the sounds that they want to say. Does that answer your question? Okay. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. I have two questions. How, the speech pathologist, um, this Medicare, Medicaid, your private insurance, do they pay for that? Most of the private insurances do pay towards speech pathology services, and Medicare and Medicaid also pay. Okay. Yes, ma'am. The other question I had, I recently had a a lady that was a bit of dementia, and this is the first time I've ever dealt with this, that she'll just look at me, I'll ask her a question, and, I, and, and her eyes tell me she knows the answer, mm -hmm. but it feels forever because I'm a little too fast answering me. Mm -hmm. But in, in about three seconds, she'll finally get the words out. This time she's losing, you know, it's her words, you know. And I've seen them lose where they can't find their room, but they can still just talk away to you. Mm -hmm. But this, I mean, she knows where her room and everything is, but... Her words, I mean, I've been talking to the psychologist, her words are getting slower and slower coming out. I mean... And it may be a delay in the processing, the auditory processing time. But yeah, I can see in her eyes that she has so much she, she wants to tell me, mm -hmm. and she knows what she wants to answer. But is there anything that... Um, Depending on the diagnosis, it may be possible to help a person like that to slow the rate at which they're losing language, to at least prolong their ability to communicate with others. And, and if they do end up losing the words, there are other things that we can do. The example of the device that you saw there was a Toby eye gaze device. That's a very, very sophisticated piece of technology, but we have much more low-tech um, type of assistive communication devices that we can help people in that situation with. Someone who may be older, who may not have experience with computers, it would not really work for them and they don't need it because they're able to use their hands, may be able to use a picture communication book mm -hmm. to point to pictures and, you know, use it to communicate with other people. So there are a number of options mm -hmm. to help them. Are there any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Not at this time. At this time, they're coming here to our outpatient rehab department. Yes, Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. I'm here three days a week. Right now, the position is part time, but it is three full days a week, which is a, a great improvement on what the availability was before. And so right now, as I said, I'm building the patient caseload, and um, we'll just see where we go from here. Are there any other questions? Are there any future plans, possibly preliminary or otherwise, to, you mentioned there's only three uh, speaking colleagues that are working in the school system, mm -hmm. uh, plans to kind of have a coordination of services uh, with the school district? There isn't anything that's officially in the works at this time. I did call and speak to the director of the speech pathologist in the school system to let them know that I'm here and I'm available. For example, students who may not qualify to receive extended school year services during the summer, if their parents want outpatient private therapy, they, you know, they can come here. And that's the extent of the coordination at this point. Any other questions? I'd like to thank all of my volunteers who helped with the reading of the profiles. I wanted to do something a little bit different and not just get up here and lecture people, but just present to you who, what are the types of people, who are they, you know, who need a speech pathologist, and that we do things that are other than just helping someone with the problem with their L sound or their R sound. Um, and also to bring some awareness to swallowing issues, voice issues, and um, people who have Lou Gehrig's disease or spinal cord injuries who might need that type of technology, and we can do it right here. And I wanted to let the community know that. And I thank you for your attention and listening.